Uh, thanks to all of you for, for being here for our discussion about the New Badger Partnership. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Darrell Bazell, the Vice Chancellor uh, for Administration. And I'm going to get the session um, started here um, today. Um, Chancellor Martin, who's a bit under the weather, as you can see, is here and will be available to help answer questions as the forum proceeds. But I'm going to start this session off with a little bit with a PowerPoint just to share some basic information about the campus budget and some of the implications for the budget as it relates to the New Badger Partnership. I, I think in past sessions, this type of um, information has proven to be helpful, I think, in the conversations that we've had. So I'm going to lead with that and then uh, feel confident that there's going to be ample time you know, for Q&A um, during the course of the afternoon. So bear with me for a, a couple of minutes. And as I walk through the slides, then feel free to ask questions or you know, offer your, your own observations uh, about the, um, the PowerPoint itself. OK? So moving forward here, I, I thought it would be useful to maybe start with a snapshot of the budget uh, at two different points in time. Uh, obviously, we have the current year budget and, and the major um, revenue streams. But also gave you a snapshot back to 1974, which is as far back as we can go um, post-merger. And, and so obviously, you can see for yourself the trends. And obviously, the, the one that we're most focused on is the, is the state support or the GPO and SPGPR. Let me give you some definitions there so you understand what, what the distinctions are. Uh, GPO, GPR is, in essence, the state money we have in Fund 101, the discretionary, flexible dollars, state dollars that the campus has to utilize. And as you know, those dollars are commingled with tuition revenue and some other revenue streams to um, um, constitute what I consider to be our core, our core funding source to carry out our, our, our basic mission. The SPGPR would be specific purpose um, GPR. In other words, tax dollars that come to the campus that are earmarked and can only be spent on a very narrow purpose. Could be dollars that come to the campus to pay for the heating and cooling of the campus. Could be dollars that are, are used to sue, um, pay the bonds, the debt service, if you will, on state-supported debt, those kinds of very targeted purposes. Um, so in other words, if we don't use the dollars for those purposes, they're not available for other uses is, is a way to think about that. And you can see the change over time where we moved from 42% of our budget, if you will, or 43, um, back in 74, to the current year where 17% of our budget is made up of those funding sources. To be clear, though, there are two things going on within that number. Clearly, some of it reflects, on a percentage basis, a decline in state support. But some of what goes on here, obviously, is a function of how wonderfully well we've done in some of our other revenue streams, be it in this beautiful facility we're in today that is, a, I think, a testament to how well our auxiliary operations have been operated and run and how they've grown over the years, along with, um, look at the federal side as a, as a proxy for federal research dollars and how that's grown um, on the campus as well. So a couple different things going on with, with this slide, but I thought it would be good um, foundation information for you. Uh, again, showing you the budget over time, um, this time with the bar chart and giving you a, kind of an intermediary marker in terms of some of the trends. So again, you can see the trend on state support and how other revenue sources have, um, have, have, have increased, on, again, on a percentage basis. Here, this is a little complicated, but uh, this helps tell the story in terms of what's been happening with our core budget. So let me kind of explain what's going on. Uh, so here, I kind of broke out again the state support, the GPO, or the Fund 101, where you see over time, it's leveled off and actually declined just a bit. But the specific purpose, as you see, has been growing, and as the, the the Fund 101 piece has, has leveled off and declined, you're seeing an uptick in the specific purpose. So what's really going on here, in essence, is that you've seen a shifting of state support. So it's true when a legislature might approach us when we complain, if you will, about the level of state support, they're saying, well, your bottom line is still growing incrementally. What's the problem? Well, the problem is, as this trend continues, you're seeing more and more of the limited state dollars being spent on specific purposes. And the, the, the part that really feeds the core mission is, 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 um, is stagnating and, and in decline at times. So while the, the bottom line may be increasing incrementally, our capacity to carry out our core mission is declining. And that's really the issue and the story in terms of what's the dynamic within um, the, the budget cuts we've been taking in recent years and why we're so concerned and have been concerned over years in terms of um, the level of state support that we've enjoyed. And of course, the other part of the story here is what's happening with tuition, where we saw for the first time in 2004 more tuition revenue being used to support the core mission 
than state support. That, 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 that's been a concern as well. So moving forward, looking at the tuition question more, more specifically, you can see what's happened over the last 10 years in terms of state support. Um, single digit increases. The outlier, of course, is 2003 through 2005 biennium. And we all might recall what occurred during that um, two year period. Um, similar to this first budget for Governor Walker and Governor Doyle's first budget, he also cut the UW system appropriation by $250 million. In that budget cycle, the primary technique that was used, as you can see, to deal with that cut was an offset through a fairly significant tuition increase, a very, very significant increase, and to the point that of the, the, the cut that the campus took during that two-year period, 72% of that cut was offset with a significant tuition increase. Since that time, it's been really, relatively level. If you take a look at the three years here, the two years for this current funding period, and the proposal you've heard from Chancellor Martin in terms of what she would do or propose as a tuition increase to a, a, a new board of trustees, if you take the mass initiative piece off, you would see a, a level line. You would see us at 5.5% in each of those years. And in fact, the same picture would be true for many of the other campuses within the UW system, where many of them also have been living with a base tuition increase of 5.5%, but many of them also have a tuition differential on top of that that takes them beyond that 5.5%. So when you hear a system talking about a 5.5% tuition level for other campuses, it's not quite true. Um, that there are those differentials that live on this campus as they do on other campuses as well. But this has been the trend line. So single digits every year except for the, the, the two-year period where tuition was used as a significant component um, to offset the, the um, budget cut. And as you see with this increase, what we're clearly signaling here is that we're not going to be dependent upon tuition as the primary method for managing the budget cut that, that confronts us today. So here's the, the, the slide I really want to uh, focus on. This um, is really about what the revenue model could be and sh perhaps should be under a public authority model. So let me get into the numbers a little bit and explain what's going on. So the basic assumption here is that I wanted to develop a model that provided for steady growth in our discretionary or, or um, core funding, if you will, you know, the funding that supports our core mission. And historically, we've done that, you saw on the earlier slide, through a combination of state support and tuition support. And I've added a, a, a new revenue stream, um, our, you know, part of our funding from the, from the um, UW Foundation. I'll talk about that in just a second. But in terms of the growth rate that I projected, I, I put in here a growth rate of about 4.5% is the assumption here. Why 4.5%? We don't need to have 4.5% growth to maintain the core mission and the amount of state support and tuition support the campus has enjoyed to carry out its core mission. But we want to make sure there's room for growth and room to do things like um, having pay plan above and beyond what the state might do, perhaps to invest in, in another mass initiative type of initiative or other kinds of things. So I want to show a couple of different things in the model here. I should also say that the other factor that informed the 4.5 percent is um, looking at where um, HEPI has been at. HEPI is the pri higher education price index. That's a I guess a higher education proxy, if you will, for what the nation uses the CPI or consumer price index for. So it's a measure that gives us a sense of the kind of growth that we've seen in higher education. And I think that mark has been at roughly right around 3.8 percent. So we, we actually have exceeded um, that, that marker as well. So what we're looking at here in, in, in this model is looking at the GPR piece. Um, what we're showing here is growth at about 2 percent growth on GPR. Why 2 percent? If you think about the kind of state support we've received in, in, in past years, money kind of, kind of comes to us, if you will, in two flavors. Money f for what we call standard budget adjustments or cost to continue. In other words, each year, or each by any funding period, if you will, some of our fixed costs, like the cost to heat and cool the campus, the cost to pay um, increasing cost of health care, those kinds of fixed costs that we're going to have to bear with or without state, state support. The good news is that the state has always stepped up to assume their fair share of those costs. And you saw some of that reflected in that SP, specific purpose slide I showed you a little bit earlier. So we're assuming in this model that that level of state support will still continue. 
The other flavor of, of new money we, we, we sometimes receive in, in, in budget cycles is for discretionary items. In the last budget cycle, for example, we received significant dollars from the state to help us get the Wisconsin Institute for Discovery off the ground. Money to help with the New Energy Institute is just a couple of examples of um, targeted increases that the state has provided for us. The good news in, in the public authority model is that the state has made a commitment to continue to fund those kinds of things. And in fact, in the budget that's currently in front of the legislature, money for costs to continue or those standard budget adjustments, if you will, are in fact provided for and, and reflected in this model. The second piece here I'll, I'll focus on is the tuition assumption. So the assumption I've, I've made here are, are relatively um, um, conservative. So what I did here was I took a look at the increase that the chancellor's indicated she's gonna propose for next year. And I carried forward that same increase assumption for the second year of the two-year funding period. But in the out years, I dropped the tuition assumption back down to 5.5%, which you saw from the earlier slide has kind of been the level that we've been at for the past number of years short of the um, tuition differential or the master initiative, if, if you will. So a 5.5% growth assumption on tuition in the out years here. 2% here. So the plug number, if you will, is what we hope to uh, um, accrue in terms of additional dollars through private philanthropy. So the assumption here is, is first of all, to recognize that the foundation has been doing wonderful things for us. They're returning to us well over $200 million um, a year. That's tremendous and, and, and really critical to the mission of the campus. But we also, what we want to do is make sure under the new model that the dollars that we can use for our core mission are, are, are in fact available for that purpose. In other words, if a donor gave us money for a new facility, that's wonderful, but it doesn't help this challenge, right? It doesn't help our core mission. So we want to make sure that we're getting increasing amounts of funding from um, our donors in one or two forms. Dollars that are truly free and clear, slimmer to what we were able to do at the School of Business a few years ago with the no-name gift. In, in that situation, we received about $85 million from donors to spend over a 20-year period in, in a way that we were able to define in ways that really served the core needs of the, of the School of Business. I think that was a wonderful demonstration of the willingness of our donors to give us flexible dollars when we ask for them and we can show a need and, and show that we would use those dollars responsibly. The other type of dollars that can be helpful here would be what I would call one-off types of um, opportunities. For example, if a donor is willing to endow a an existing professorship or a dean's chair, what we can do is use those dollars to support that cost and, in essence, free up existing dollars we're using that are used for that purpose to actually then, in turn, serve the core mission. I think that's probably the more likely scenario in, in terms of how we can raise additional dollars. So to get there, though, we're going to give the foundation two years to kind of retool and, and refocus. They are far along in that, in that thought process and, and, and in terms of not just thinking about it, beginning, beginning to operationalize that concept. So I'm, I'm very optimistic that we are going to, in fact, be successful with that type of um, effort. So to get to the 4.5% growth rate, again, continued modest increase in state support for cost to continue, modest increases in tuition in the out years at that 5.5%, and then additional support from our foundation in the way of flexible dollars to serve our core mission. So what I want to do is then drill down and give you a, a snapshot of what a year would look like under that model. And so here's what that first year would look like in 2014 under, the, under this, this model. So on the right side of the, of the pie chart, these are the things we need to do to serve that cost to continue need, if you will. And as you can see in the model, we're going to serve it in, in the way we always have, through a combination of, of state support and tuition support. Those have been the two revenue streams that have always supported um, that increased fixed cost, if you will. And that's what this model provides. But this model also then provides for a wonderful opportunity for us to invest new dollars. Could be dollars we, we invest in pay plan. Again, could be dollars for new student initiatives or other kinds of things that the campus identifies as strategic needs of the campus. So in, in, in my mind, if you take a look at the other chart and, and how this, we, we kind of do the drill down, to me, based on the conservative estimates provided, this tells me that we have a sustainable funding model one that can continue to leverage state dollars um, with modest twist increases to serve our core needs, but also provide for 
a margin of excellence, if you will, in ways that, that we struggle to provide for now, um, quite frankly. We think this is doable. We think through conversations we've had, not just with the foundation, but with a number of donors, that they are energized by this possibility and have shown a willingness to step up to help make this model a, a reality and something that, that, is, that is eminently feasible. So I, I thought we would start with this because a lot of the questions I've been getting in the past few weeks have been around some of these kinds of assumptions. Can you still assume, Daryl, are we going to get state support in the future? Will the state divest? Um, what about um, philanthropy? How does that fit into the picture? And, and oh, by the way, what are those assumptions around tuition? You know, you hear all these assumptions about Madison racing to look like Michigan or some, you know, high tuition state. Uh, it's clear from this model, we don't have to go there. We do not have to go there for this public authority model to work extremely well for us. Uh, so uh, again, the idea is just to use it as a backdrop to help um, you know, provide a little more information to you to help our conversation um, this afternoon. So with that, I'll stop with the, with the presentation. And let's open this up for, you know, for questions and, and, and comments. Hi, Daryl. Um, I was just wondering, uh, when you're talking about the core mission, um, under Chapter 37, the Wisconsin hospitals and clinics are moved under UW-Madison's uh, control. Um, are you considering those as part of your um, core mission strategy in, in that uh, graph that you were showing? Uh, the answer is no. And the UW hospital, the statutory authorization and rules that govern them you are correct, move from chapter 36 to chapter 37, but that in no way to suggest that the relationship between the campus and the hospital changes materially from a governor's perspective. They will still be an independent um, authority that serves a public purpose. We will still um, engage with them as members of their, of their governing board, but their governor structure does not actually change. We're, just for, uh, we're simply moving them over because we see them as being more affiliated with, with our campus as opposed to the system. So it's more of a matter of convenience, if you will. Hi, Daryl. Ed Van Gemmert from the libraries. Um, so Daryl, regardless of the, the structure, the governance structure that we'd be under, the foundation could increase its support. And we could, in theory, I suppose, use that to support the core mission, as you refer to it. So could you talk a little bit about what pieces of the public authority, maybe the policy pieces that would increase flexibility to make that money more purposeful? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Ed. And it's not, in my mind, simply a question of being able to use those dollars in a more efficient and effective manner. In the converse, we think by moving to a public authority model where we could have, um, I guess, more freedom, if you will, um, a more streamlined way of doing things, that in of itself we think will help energize our donor base to, to position them to be um, more philanthropic, if you will, around the, the core mission needs. But you're exactly right. Um, with the public authority model, the ability to have a more efficient and responsive human resources system we think is critical and certainly um, is something that might not and probably would not be possible under a, a model short of public authority, if you will, if we stay part of a state agency um, governance structure. Um, clearly in the procurement area, we can demonstrate um, cost savings both in terms of procuring goods and services that are unique to higher education. Um, we can show about a $2 million annual savings on our property insurance program. Um, for example, if we move to a public authority model, we can have our own um, program, so to speak. Our construction management program, a program that's been um, um, heavily supported by our donor base. Um, there's no question that we can save significant dollars each and every year by gaining control over the management of those projects. So there are a number of, and I can go on, but there are a number of very tangible and real examples of where we can be more efficient, more responsive, and increase the quality of what we're doing if we have more control over those, um, of those decisions. Hi, um, I actually have two questions, and if a lot of people have questions, we can come back to me, but, and they're not at all related, but 
Um, the first one is just about human resources in general. I'm a human resources manager here on campus, and I was watching the stream of the forum yesterday put on by the TAA, and there was a lot of discussion about being able to keep you know, faculty, academic staff, classified staff, and, and um, from my experience, a lot of it is an issue of money that we're not able to pay you know, top dollar for our good people. There was some discussion from someone, and I'm sorry, I don't know who she represented. I think she was part of the TAA that said there were a lot of other reasons that people come to Madison. But based on my experience in HR, we get a lot of complaints from supervisors, department chairs, faculty that, you know, a lot of people are going to leave because of our inability to pay top dollar. Can you go into uh, what you think the benefits would be with our ability to um, do our own human resources? Sure, I'll, I'll offer a, a couple of thoughts, and others may have some additional you know, um, insights to offer on, on this really important question, because I think the question of having our own, own HR system goes right to the core, if you will, of why a public authority model is desirable for the campus. Um, and I would agree that many people come to work on this campus for reasons other than simply getting top dollar. We're a great great quality of life in this community, a great community um, for of research, um, lots of reasons why people want to be here. But as you know and I know, at the end of the day, money always matters. It's always an important component. And there's no question that the quality of life and other types of things that have attracted faculty and staff here are not going to keep them here in and of themselves, that we are, need to do something with, with our HR system. So here's some of the things I would, would point to. I would argue that our ability to provide additional dollars under the current business model are constrained a bit, which again, in part, can be addressed, I shouldn't say in part, can in fact be addressed through the model I, I, I showed here. But think about things like progression series, where employees cap out and are stuck for years and years and years. This is particularly true with academic staff, um, are just stuck, and it's true also with a lot of our classified staff as well. So the ability to have appropriate pace ranges and structures is something that we clearly would want to address. A system that allows us to do our own titling to create position titles that actually makes sense uh, for us. I had a discussion with some UW system folks just on Friday around some of these issues and around some constraints we have in, in the way of titling and the way the progression series works. And it became a circular conversation because some of the problems I pointed out, many of the others in the room, and we have representatives from every member institution in the room, they're always nodding their heads. And as the issue was explored, the answer almost invariably was, we're stuck because of system policies, not simply because of what's happening at OSER. And no one can give me a rational answer for why some of the policies exist, but they're there, and they're not changing. Uh, so having a, a, a more rational and responsive tiling system, pay range, you know, designations, I, I think would be extremely helpful. The ability to reward faculty based on merit is something we can't do presently very frustrating. It seems, it seems counterintuitive. So the ability to, again, create a system that really truly responds to the needs that we have in this campus, which in some cases are, in fact, distinct and different than the challenges that confront some of the comprehensive institutions. So I think it's not simply a question of having a system that works better for higher education in general. It's a system that's specifically responsive to the needs of a major public um, research institution. Um, can I ask another question? Um, this has to do with uh, the board of the proposed board of regents. I know it doesn't have to do with um, please, the budget, please. but um, I actually went to the University of Michigan, which, as everyone probably knows, it's ridiculously expensive. I was also from out of state, so it was even more expensive. But as you probably also know, when the University of Michigan was founded in the early 1800s, it was founded basically on this public authority idea that it didn't want to be beholden to the state of Michigan. It didn't want to be beholden to the whims of whoever was in power in the state. And so I'm just sort of used to that. But their regents are actually elected by the people of the state of Michigan. So there's actually been a regent who's been there since 1994. She just keeps getting reelected every six years. And so I'm just sort of curious how you all came up with uh, this idea of um, the proposed board of regents, because I'm you know, familiar also, I'm from Illinois, so I know in Illinois that they're appointed by the governor, like the current system board of regents is appointed. But I'm curious how this one was thought Sure, of. I'll offer some thoughts on that, and others may have some, some, some thoughts uh, about this as well. Well, we see great value 
and just the whole notion of having a board that's focused on us. The Human System Board of Regents are made up of fine individuals who have you know, our best interests and the best interests of 25 other campuses at heart, and that is where a lot of the problem lies. We need a board that's focused on us, a board that's going to help us um, take research to discovery, a board that's going to help us with our philanthropic um, um, endeavors, a board that's really going to help us with our mission and help us execute it. That's really difficult, if not impossible, to achieve when you have a board that's focused on 26 entities of, of, of very different um, natures, if you will. So just the whole idea of having a local board is extremely, extremely important. But the actual construct of it um, is, is one that was um, thought out. And I, I, I would suggest a couple things. Number one, and let's go right to one of the key questions here. Why 11 appointees by a governor? Well, that was our idea. We originally um, proposed a 21-member board. It would, it was, these would all be Madison appointments, but we discovered as we were working on the bill that for some very important reasons, we still needed to have treatment as a state agency or a state entity for certain purposes beyond you know, the inherent public nature of, of what we do. In order to fulfill that obligation, the state had to control the majority of appointments. It had to be 50% plus one. So that's why you see 11 of the 21 being gubernatorial appointments. We want to make sure that, uh, to the extent possible, that all the appointees, in fact, had our best interests at heart. One way to do that, we believe, was to, is to make sure that the board is constituted of our folks, our affiliates, alums. Um, so we, we, we try to do that. We also try to crosswalk. There's a, a regent that would serve on this body. We're honoring the land grant nature of, of this campus and the mission of this campus by having an agricultural representative. But on our side of the ledger, on the 10 side, if you will, um, one of the things you typically don't see, and I don't, I don't think Michigan's different, um, how often do you see faculty, staff, and students having voting power on an institutional governing board? I'd argue we've gone above and beyond virtually where anyone else in this country has gone in terms of allowing and facilitating um, that type of governance um, involvement um, in, in our you know, decision making. So we want to make sure that people have our best interests at heart, people that really understood us and were focused entirely on us. And we, we try to err on the side of making sure these are, we populate the board with folks who, who brought a variety of perspectives to the table and, and really honored governance and really gave student, staff, and faculty a voice in, in, in the overall governance of the campus. Thank you. Hi, Daryl. Um, so this is a package of flexibilities that you've asked for here. And sometimes we don't get every flexibility or everything in a package that we want. So I'm curious um, if you get some of what you asked for in terms of flexibilities, like for example, you get all of them except you don't get management of resources or management of construction. How does that change your financial model? And in particular, how does that model and the role for tuition and the projected tuition change if you have public authority versus not? So using your example, um, it changes nothing in the model. The reason it changes nothing is that on the construction management side, what you're really dealing with there, well, I should say, what we're dealing with here is the operating budget, right? Mm -hmm. The capital budget doesn't, influence, it doesn't impact right. this. It simply means that we'll continue into the future with less efficient ways of constructing facilities, mm -hmm. um, constructing facilities that oftentimes aren't done correctly because mm -hmm. we're not providing the oversight, but it has no direct financial, no implication to the financial model here. Mm -hmm. There's not a connection between the two. And the control of the revenues? The sweep? The sweep, well, what that does is, is help make sure that we don't have, to, I would argue it has the opposite effect of, of what may be, the hypothesis might be. The extent that we have sweeps means that we have to do things to re replenish the fund. Oh, yeah. Which means that you have to then increase fees even higher to protect those funds. Um, I think what's happened in recent years has been marginal in terms of things we've had to do to replenish the pot, if you will. Um, but there, there is a, a marginal impact there. I don't know that it would be to the extent that it changes the, the, the fundamental um, um, principles in, in, the, in the model here, but it's certainly um, to the extent that um, revenue from student housing is swept, mm -hmm. um, it, could have, it certainly could have a, a, a marginal implication for housing rates, for example. So I just want to make sure I understand that. I'm trying to figure out what the cost savings of the management of resources is and what happens if you don't get those to all the other streams? Because well, I'm having a hard time understanding why the state would allow us to, they use that money right now, right? So it's an expense to the state to give that up. 
Like well, DOA right now, well, really right now it's an easy for the state to give up. I'll tell you why. Mm -hmm. If you look at the revenue that would accrue by, the, you know, by investing the, um, the corpus, if you will, of, of, the, um, of, of the annual appropriations that we receive, right now, because of where the economy's at, for this year, if this year were, were a year that we, in fact, would get those earnings, we're talking about $400,000 to the state. We do believe over time, as the economy rebounds, that the amount of interest earnings do become significant and will become beneficial to the campus. But we're in this environment right now where there are deep budget cuts, and the state may see this as an easy thing to give up because there's not much revenue associated with it in, in the near term. So I see this as an opportunity to get our foot in the door and to change that model such that by the time the economy really rebounds and we start seeing more significant earnings, those are our dollars, and they will actually go to our bottom line and help our operating budget. But we, I've not built those assumptions into this model. So again, as I suggested earlier, the revenue assumptions in this model are extremely conservative. I want to make it clear and without any question that this model is, in fact, sustainable. So all those things we've talked about, um, savings on um, procurement efficiencies, um, savings on you know, protecting sweeps, um, getting the interest earnings, None of those things are in this model. Those are all enhancers, um, if you will. So this is very doable. But what this does, again, is really help energize our donor base. Um, clearly, in the near term, though, we will get some benefits by having those flexibilities. We need all the help we can get to manage a $62 million budget cut, right? So we'll get some benefit out of it. But my point is, we're not totally dependent upon those things happening to I I I ensure our viability on, on, under the model. So if we get some of those things on a public authority model, um, we, it'd be great. If we get all of them, it'd be even better. Thank you, Daryl. I'm Kathy O'Brien from Do It, and I'm certainly no expert in achieving gifts from donors. But one of the things that, going back to Ed Van Gebert's question, is we're assuming that we won't have to do the massive increases in tuition because it will energize the donor base. Do we have anecdotal evidence from peer institutions or anecdotal evidence from our donors that part of the things that are holding them up is that we're restricted with a lot of, I would say, red tape? I, I think yes. The answer is cl clearly yes. And I, I, there's been um, great, a great response from our, our donor base, particularly from, from key donors and major donors, who have told us that they are, in fact, energized. And as we've reached out and the foundation has reached out and, and spoken to a, a wide range of donors about this possibility, that's the feedback we're receiving. And let's be honest, there's low-hanging fruit here. This isn't simply about continuing to work with a small group of major donors. This is about reaching out to all of our alums, 380,000 living alums around this world, that we haven't reached out nearly to the extent that we can and should. So the idea is, isn't simply about trying to make sure John Morgish continues to give or some of the obvious um, major donors. It's about really um, changing our philosophy a bit and reaching out much more broadly, not just with major campaigns, but also with annual giving campaigns. And you know, I do a lot of work in the nonprofit community, and I can tell you that's the lifeblood of, of, of a nonprofit is an annual campaign. Low-hanging fruit that we really haven't leveraged enough and taken full advantage of. So I see lots of potential out there, and we're seeing enough um, optimism, if you will, from our, our donor base to suggest that, that yes, they, they will in fact be energized, and we can anticipate um, significant new dollars coming to us in ways that really serve our core mission. There's still lots of food in the back. Other thoughts from folks? Other questions or? Well I, well, I have you here. Um, the system. I'm really interested in the conversation you had with the system um, about uh, the particular issue of, of job titles and, and such. But um, you said something which is the, uh, that, it, that sounded to me basically like we, we can't get the system to change, so we need to get out. And can you give us more of a sense of when the conversations with the system occurred, when they've taken place about changing the system, what constituency we had sort of in terms of asking for changes from the system? Like, have all the chancellors gotten together and put forth a plan that said, here are the following five things of systems rules that we really need to have changed, and did we have a board of regents and a president who said no? I mean, I, that's basically what I'm asking, is have we really tried to change the system before we've well, tried to get out? Yeah, it's a very fair question. And let's be clear, this isn't simply about the system, but some of the constraints 
we operate under are by virtue of our relationship with system. And if you remember, on things like HR, system functions under delegated authority from the state. That delegation has not found its way to the Madison campus, and that lies at the center of the issue here. We want to make sure if there are flexibilities that are possible, we want to make sure they happen right at the campus level, and, and that we don't simply recreate system as another department of administration or another office of state employment relations. But yes, under the current construct, there have been discussions. In fact, I can think back a couple years ago where there was a, a major focus effort around the question of delegating more authority and responsibility to each of the member institutions within the system. I can tell you it was a very sobering experience. And I can tell you, by the, and I served as a campus representative on that committee, by the time we got to the second meeting, the conversation had turned itself on its head. It was no longer about what flexibilities should be delegated to the institutions. It became a question about what more things do we want the system to do. They completely turned the whole discussion around to a point where people walked away from the table, and we, we never got to the point where we could confront <laughs> and, and really challenge um, system administration and, and, and the Board of Regents. We just, could, we just can't get to that point in the discussion. Um, but yes, there have been a number of efforts over time to encourage system to, to delegate more. I'll give an example from the last region meeting at Platteville, uh, where we talked about the public authority model and there was, more importantly in this context, Wisconsin idea of partnership, you know, the competing proposal, where there's this thought that a system gets more flexibilities, somehow they'll trickle down to the campuses. Well, some of the Board of Regents and others in the audience were skeptical of that. And, you know, you know a promise is nice, but if I can see it in black and white in the statutes, I might become a believer. So what did system do to demonstrate their commitment to this? They whipped out an existing statute in Chapter 36 that requires them, requires them to delegate responsibilities to campus to the extent possible. Here's an existing statute they've never really used, and we're to rely on that as the promise that any additional flexibilities that accrue to them will in fact be passed through. So the track record of delegating flexibilities is, is really poor at the system level, extremely poor. This is being um, streamed. Why is that? Well, I, I think system um, much, I, I think there are a couple of reasons. I think system, much like the Department of Administration, place I used to work, so I'm not, not taking shots in the state I, I don't understand and have been a part of in the past. I think there's a, a, a belief that they truly are adding value. I really believe that they see the world with that lens, that they really are adding value. The second point I'd make is, this really plays out the first, that in some cases, they are. I can think of a number of situations, particularly in the administrative area, where some of the work they, they do really creates an efficiency, particularly for comprehensive campuses. That's not so true for us, but it'd be hard for me to imagine a scenario, for example, using the, the illustration of the back about construction management, that every institution within the UW system can manage its own construction projects with their current capacity. They probably can't. We can but some of the smaller institutions probably can't take that on and probably would benefit by having an entity like system to help leverage that expertise and, and critical mass of, of knowledge that you need to, to manage certain things. So in my mind, part of it is, it is, is at times a false assumption about value added. And other times, I think, particularly for the conference of campuses, there really is a leverage and efficiency that is gained um, by, by working with system. Again, not so true for us, but certainly true to a larger extent for some of the other campuses. I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about process in terms of the, the political process. Yeah. So here's where we're at. As we all know, the bill has been in front of the legislature since early February. And as we know, there are several stops along the way, Joint Committee on Finance, then it hit each of the House, you know, hit the Assembly and the Senate, probably in culminating with the Conference Committee, which is the typical practice. So what you would typically see in a finance process is you bring the agency heads in, which they've done, you hold hearings around the state, which have been accomplished. As of last Tuesday, the, the Joint Committee on Finance began to make decisions. Here's how you see their process playing out in the coming weeks. 
Um, they'll start with the smaller agencies in terms of budget size. Sometime in the next two weeks, they'll do another revenue estimate and to help answer the question and get a little more certain in their mind in terms of how much revenue is available in the next two years so you can really make more informed decisions about resource allocation. After that period of time, they'll then begin to make decisions around the bigger state entities like UW System, like Medicare, Medicaid, Department of Corrections, shared revenue, school aids, those kinds of big, very big ticket items. Here's the misnomer. What people will observe is that the joint finance process will probably drag into perhaps early June. In the minds of many, that means the process, again, is, is languishing. That's probably not what's actually happening, though. I think because you have one party in control of both houses and the governorship, that, and with the budget with some very difficult decisions in it, with big implications, not just at the state level, but for local government, you're going to see a budget pass on time. But the way they're going to accomplish that is to do the heavy lifting in the Joint Committee on Finance. And I expect the, the bill to um, not stay on the floor of either house for any lengthy period of time, perhaps is, um, only for a week on each, in each house. There will clearly be some areas of disagreement between the Senate and Assembly, always are, but I think they'll be minimized because of the extra work that will occur at the Joint Committee on Finance level. So I would anticipate that we'll see a budget passed um, at or before the, the start of the new fiscal year. Hi. Um, one of the things that I'm hearing is the possible compromise of having a public authority but still under UW system, um, similar to how the hospitals and clinics is currently run. Um, does that affect your projections in, in the budgetary and how do you foresee that type of operation working for this university? Well, a, a couple of thoughts. Um, for that to occur, you have to presume that UW system becomes a public authority, right? We're not going to have public authority status and, we, you know, under that model, I'm assuming if we're part of the system, we have that status, they have that status. I think that's not a likelihood, first of all, that that's likely to, to occur. Um, but if we remain, let's just say we remain part of the system, the question still becomes what flexibilities are in the budget and which of those flexibilities actually accrue to the campus in a way that allows us to be nimble, to be efficient, and realize some of the savings that we think are possible under the public authority model. I don't know what that mix might be, but I am skeptical, you know, going back to the cash management question. Um, under a state agency model, which I think the system will end up continuing to be, the cash management opportunity, I think, vaporizes. I think the building, again, as we talked earlier about the HR system, probably doesn't happen. Um, because of the, the degrees of freedom offered under those two um, um, flexibilities, those things probably it's unprecedented for those things to happen for a state agency. And so, again, the things that are most attractive to us under this public authority model, first of all, probably wouldn't happen. And the things that, that could happen budgetarily in terms of perhaps construction management flexibility or um, procurement flexibility, you still have the question as to whether or not those flexibilities would actually be passed directly on to us. And that's, that's a, a, a question that's, I, I don't know what the answer is today. I'm skeptical given what you've heard me say in, in, you know, a few minutes ago. Other thoughts or questions for folks? Going? Sure. So let me offer this. Um, if we've kind of exhausted you know, questions and, and, and the comments you have, uh, I, I guess what I would offer is um, ask you to continue to take a look at our website, go into your question, Ed, about staying on top of what's, what's happening. Um, that's still the primary place you should go to get information about what's happening you know, with, with the budget proposal. We try to keep that site current on a daily basis, so I would direct you, um, you know, to that site, um, if you will. Um, to your other point about timing, again, We'll probably have this voted on sometime within the next within the next month, so we should look for that. Not going to happen this week. Probably won't happen next week, but probably you know two, three, four weeks out, we'll see an actual vote on this. And, and clearly, you hear the sentiment um, of the administration that this is something we feel strongly about. That the belief is that we need a strongly held feeling that we need this 
to really help ensure our future, our preeminence in a way that allows us to remain competitive with our peers, not just across the country, but around the world. And that's what we're fighting for right now. Thank you.